So he rounded up a bunch of thugs, surrounded the group, and beat them with clubs, and threw them out of the city and down a cliff. And, um, you know, he's telling me this whole story. He's smiling, and, you know, uh, you know, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness. Like, and he's telling me, he says, that later that evening, because it was dark, he says, we finally found each other. And when we found each other, some of us were missing teeth and things like this, you know, that, that had been knocked out. And, uh, and, and so we went home. You know, it was, it was done. About a year later, he ran into somebody from that village who had been, become a Christian because of their mission trip. And that person ran into him at a training uh, conference for Christians. And he told him that there was a small church that was thriving in that village because of their witness. And so, you know, he tells me this with a big smile because he has, you know, it's a great story. He has served Christ, he has suffered for Christ, and brought Christ's uh, name to a place where it previously had not been. And the person that he ran into was one of the thugs. So it's just, I mean, it's amazing, amazing stories here. So we got the chance to go out to some villages here. Um, now, this is not a completely unreached village. This is the outskirts of Bowboro. And we're going to this village here where Pastor Pollard is pointing um, to two or three houses, uh, yeah, about three houses that we went through, I should say huts, thatch roof, mud wall, huts, um, where when they saw us coming, they gathered together because there were uh, several believers in the village who uh, we were going out to meet who were not able to make it to church on Saturday. These are the people that earn two to three dollars a month, um, you know, to collect plastics and take them to the recycling company and get paid for them. Um, they gathered around to hear a message from, from me, which I had no idea that I was about to give them until we sat down and Peter goes to me and says, what are you going to teach them? And I was like, me? I'm going to teach them something? Like, uh, okay, I'll do it, but next time give me some warning. And he said, okay. He said, I'll teach them something first and give you a little bit of a head start. So for about three to five minutes, he taught them on the uh, Lazarus and the rich man from the gospel. Jesus tells the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And I have never heard it preached or taught in the way that he taught it. He said to them, our ancestors are like the rich man. They are in hell right now because they didn't know who Jesus was, because they didn't believe in Jesus. And right now, they're asking Jesus to send somebody back to save us from going to that same place. And that was so powerful to think about it in that way because, you know, we in the West – we like to think of our ancestors as all being in heaven. You know, we can hardly wait to get to heaven to see grandma, grandpa, you know, great grandparents, meet them. But, you know, that is not assumed in any sense by this culture. Um, you know, they know because their, their grandparents and their parents weren't Christians. And so they know. And they accept that. And it motivates them to be evangelistic and to do everything they can to share the gospel. So he shared for about three to five minutes on that, and I know that's missing a scripture verse. That's what we're missing. I had a scripture verse here. The scripture verse that I thought about was Revelation chapter 2. It's the letter to the church in Smyrna, and Revelation is written to a people that are very much in their situation. They're oppressed, they're attacked, they're persecuted, and they're ready to quit. They are Christians whose society does not like them. They don't want them to be Christians. And so they've attacked them in every way. And Revelation is really a book that's written to encourage people on the verge of quitting their faith, of giving up their faith. And so in, in the letter to Smyrna, it says, I know your poverty, and yet you are rich. And I talked about their po poverty, which is obviously poverty. I said, how is it that you're rich? You know, you've got an inheritance waiting for you in heaven, far more valuable than anything you have here on earth. He says, I know you're suffering. And those who persecute you, that's what the letter says. And I said, you know, Jesus knows it. But he says your suffering will be for only 10 days. And I said, it's a short time. Life here on earth is a short time. And he says, for those who overcome, I will give a crown of life. And the second death will not hurt. And I talked about what is the symbolism of a crown of life. A crown is for a king or a queen. And I said, if you overcome, if you stay faithful to Christ, you will receive a crown. You will be kings and queens. Christ's kingdom. And at that point, the Holy Spirit kind of kicked me in the butt, and uh, I jumped up with this crown, and I went around, and I said, you will be a queen. You will receive a crown. In God's kingdom, you will be a princess. You know, and they, they were, the, the translator was getting excited and ex more and more excited. He didn't have to say it. I said, you will be a king. You will be a queen. You will be a 
And he was saying, and he was getting excited, they were getting excited, they were laughing, thinking about themselves. Dirt poor, three dollars a month, raised to be kings and queens in Christ's kingdom. And it was just, it was overwhelming, and they were laughing. And so when I say encouragement, this is what I'm talking about. They were encouraged to not give up, even though society would do everything they could would have them do. Uh, society would do everything to make them quit. And then once we were done, once again, almost universally, everybody wanted prayer. Then we left the small group in the same village, and we headed down to a, a little hut where a woman had given birth to a baby the day before. So we went into the hut, and uh, they welcomed us, and they just they wanted prayer for the baby. I prayed for the baby. I prayed for the woman, and uh, they were very much they were very much pleased to have uh, you know a foreigner because some of those children that you're seeing pictures of have never seen a foreigner. They've never seen somebody with white skin and round eyes. So this was the village, and between those two huts was where we met. And then we headed out, and this is Fishtail again, the holy mountain that, that's there in the Himalayas. And we headed over to the tailor's residence, and uh, I say tailors because that's what they are. They are tailors. They, uh, the seamstress, seam, seamster, tailor. Um, and it was very interesting. Wherever I went, one of the first things they'd do, whatever house I went to, the first thing they would do, they would see us coming, they would grab their Bible and say, what are you going to teach us? What are you going to teach us? They'd grab their Bible and say, open it up. Where should we open? Teach us anything from anywhere. The spiritual hunger, the hunger for God's word, which is so intense, it was overwhelming. It was just so, they were so eager to learn anything from anybody who had any knowledge about the Bible. Whatsoever. They were just eager. They called their friends. You can see here the man on the right is the husband, right beside him is his wife. Um, they called their children. They called their cousins. They called their family. They called their in laws. The woman that's sitting in the back is an in law. Anybody that they could get, anybody that they could gather, when they saw us coming, they gather and say, okay, now teach us. Teach us. And they would, we would teach, and then we would pray, and then we would just, uh, you know, here we are in their backyard. This is the translator's house. We got to his house. That's his wife right there in the foreground. His wife, his parents, um, some friends, uh, some, uh, I'm not sure, relatives. Uh, probably about 15 people all together. And again, what are you going to teach us? Teach us something about God's word. Teach us anything. Just an eagerness to grow in God's word. I think sometimes we lose that because we've got the Bible. You know, I think the, the week before I left, the, the, I, I shared with you the fact that we have average of four Bibles per American household, and 60% of people say they don't read them. You know, that's not the case here. They are eager to learn God's Word. I think that uh, we might learn something from that. We had lunch together, and then we headed out. We took the bus back. It was much cheaper, and we weren't in so much of a hurry. One of the stops we made, I saw the beautiful mountainscape. So I walked over to the edge to take a picture, and I saw all this rustling and movement of the garbage down below, and I thought, oh, the wind is blowing. Except I suddenly realized my brain kind of calculated everything that was going on in the peripheral vision there, and all of the movement was like this, away from me. And I realized there's no wind blowing down on my head to move and rustle all the papers that way. And so I looked, and there were monkeys all over the place. And you can see right here in the dead center of the screen, it's kind of hard to make out here, but right here, is a monkey, and we saw monkeys everywhere, but there was trash. They're kind of like rats. They can kind of travel all where the trash is, they're picking through it and just eat whatever they can find. Then back to Boulder, where I got to do a little sightseeing because my visa fell through, my, my plans to go to Quebec, my plans to go to Bhutan didn't work out because of visa issues between me and Peter. We didn't have the same um, visas, so there were some issues going on there. So we ended up having an extra day in, in uh, Kathmandu. So I got to do a little sightseeing while I was there. And I decided that I would go to the most famous temple in Kathmandu, the most famous Hindu temple, and this is it. Um, they wanted to charge me an exorbitant amount of money to go inside the temple. And I said to, I said to Peter, you know, I don't really want to pay that. Let's just walk around the outside. Maybe we'll find the back door. So we walked around, and sure enough, we found the spot that was open. We walked back, and uh, inside the temple, we discovered the most disgusting polluted river I had ever seen. You can see the 
trash and everything is all down here. The birds coming down to pick through it. Uh, it was, I mean, it smelled bad. Um, but it was, it was bad. I was glad I did not pay the high fee to go in. The one thing I was glad I did get to see, which I had hoped to see, was off in the background here, I'll zoom in a little bit here, is some uh, cremations, three or four cremations going on at once right here by the side of this holy river. Um, and the ashes falling into the river of the cremation, um, along with all the other, with, with the, uh, with the other pollution and trash that they, that they have in there. But this was, uh, interesting. And then I, I was able to stay there for about five minutes until the, uh, security came and kicked us out. Then I went up to the top of the hill and took some more pictures. You can see the smoke from the cremation going on there over top of the, the roofs of the temple there. And, uh, I did get a, uh, a sound bite here. Hindus at worship, and uh, they're reciting some scriptures, so I wanted you to have a chance to hear what it sounds like for Hindus to worship. His wife had a lake, had her own lake in the middle of town. Um, and as I said, this was largely about encouraging. I went from church to church, from world to world, from Christian to Christian. They did everything I can to lift their spirits and to encourage them not give up being Christians. To encourage one another to all the more as you see the day approaching. As we flew out of Nepal to India, I got to accomplish one of my uh, life's goals, and that was to see Mount Everest, and here's a picture from the airplane of Mount Everest. Now, I have a homework assignment for you this week. Um, since, since we've been talking all about encouragement, my homework assignment for you is to find one Christian and to encourage them in their faith journey, to encourage them in their walk, to think of some way to encourage them as they continue to strive to follow Christ in their life. That's a homework assignment. I encourage you to take that assignment and to use it um, and to find that person and to encourage them. At this time, I would welcome any questions if you have them. Um, I can answer maybe just a couple questions um, if there are any. And if not, then uh, we will sing a hymn and then we'll close in prayer. Does anybody have any questions that you didn't understand or you want clarification on or clarification on? If not, chance to serve you in this way, and I want to ask your blessing on this congregation as they have supported me, and this work has been their work. Uh, because they let me go, because they prayed for me, because they encouraged me to go, because they supported me uh, prayerfully, financially, uh, verbally, with letters, with emails, Father, uh, this is their ministry. Uh, they have touched the hearts of the people in Nepal and blessed them and encouraged them. Father, I want to thank you for that and ask that you would let this uh, report be a blessing to them, that they may this week go into their places of business, their schools, with a renewed sense of vigor and a uh, renewed sense of vitality as they serve you and as they live their lives.